Alright, so we're back and we're going to be talking about commutation relations for a complex scalar field. Um, so let's, okay, yeah, so let's get right into this. So again, this is, this is my template right here. My, I'm doing this thing now where I write out everything and then I go through everything uh, bit by bit. And so you can, so that you can really see what's going on that we, so um, if you want to skip, you can and you won't miss anything and uh, yeah, so let's get right into this. So we're still looking at scalar fields. Um, I feel like students who go through quantum or quantum field theory find scalar fields to be kind of boring. And but the, there's a reason we start off with scalar fields. It's because they're a little bit simpler to handle, and they're a little bit I wouldn't say easier to visualize. But um, I'm gonna come to a visualization later that might help us in sort of uh, not really understanding everything in terms of that visualization, but um, uh, getting uh, all these concepts organized in our mind. But that, that's later. So let's go over the commutation relations for a complex scalar field. Okay. So, and again, I have these sentence-like things to really help us, uh, to really help us guide our way, uh, guide ourselves through uh, these derivations that I'm going to put on the board here. So we start off by understanding that the Klein-Gordon equation has wave solutions. So if you if you recall the Klein-Gordon equation, it's got uh, solutions, and those solutions look like this. There are these there are these fields, right? They're a function of x and t, right? And when we say complex scalar field, that means they have a, there's a complex conjugate to these fields as well, right? So let's take a look at what these look like. These so we came to the, this general we came to this generalization. In particular, we came to this one. But nothing should stop us from coming to this one. Now, how is this one different? Well, we have different coefficient to start to start off. We have a different coefficient. Um, and then we have this right here. So this is different just by one subtlety, and that's this right here. But they're both waves, right? They're both waves, right? Because and they have to be waves because they, they have to be solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. The Klein-Gordon equation is a wave equation. Now, how? Now, I'm going to justify for a second. Why are these guys waves? Well, if you remember um, from way back when, when you had worked on when we had worked on, um, or when you had worked on Euler's formula, E to the i theta, or phi, equals cosine of phi uh, plus i sine of phi, like that. And this right here would be phi, right? This right here is phi. It would would actually be, in this case though, if we had a negative right here, which we do right here, right, then that means we could theoretically just do e to the i negative phi. And we put negative phi in here and negative phi in here. And that doesn't change the fact, that won't change the fact that this is a wave, right? It'll just change this sign because the sign here is anti-symmetric, but cosine is, is symmetric. Because if you remember, cosine of negative phi is the same thing as cosine of phi. So that, that's what it means to be symmetric. So really all that changes is just um, this guy right here. And I call it, a, I call it an oppositely oriented wave when we have the negative right here. When we have this negative right here. It's got an opposite orientation, but nevertheless, it's still a wave. So, and we could prove to ourselves that this is indeed a solution to the kind of Gordon equation, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to say this is a solution. Oop, wrong tool. Then I'm going to say this is a solution to the Klein Gordon equation. All right, we have our normalization factors. We have these coefficients, which are complex, because we have the, the, we're saying that there's a that there's a complex conjugate to them, so they're complex. This is what makes it a complex scalar field. 
then we have these waves, these differently oriented waves. And then we say the, um, the complex conjugate of this, of our wave solution is just a complex conjugate of everything else, since it's such that if we were to apply this to this, we get, um, um, we should get, uh, one, if I remember correctly, uh, and so this is what, this is, in order to get that salute, to, in order to get that result, this result right here, equal to, I think, I believe it was one, we need this, we need this to take this form. Okay. So that is, so the, so that's the solution to the, the two solutions, generalized solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. Now, the canonical momentum is associated with the time derivative of the complex conjugate of the position. Now, I'm just going to take this to be a definition for right now, and we'll see why. We're going to see that if this defin this right here, this right, right here, is going to help us come to this conclusion, right? And this conclusion is very useful, and so we're going to say that this is equal to a different variable, and this thing is going to have some importance because of this result. But so, let's take the time derivative of the complex conjugate, and we get this. Now, I'll zoom in a little bit more to ask, that we want to ask the question, okay, why? Why this? Why this? Well, the only difference between this and this are these guys. Right? We have time derivatives, so we're, we have a spatial part and a time, a temporal part. The spatial part, when we take the time derivative, is just going to go away. And we're just left with the coefficient on the temporal part. Right, so this negative i omega k is going to get is going to be brought up front, and then we have our e to the i phi again. That's chain rule, right? This is so to go from here to here is a chain rule on the time derivative on time on the on the temporal component, uh, and we do the same thing here, right? We bring i omega over i omega. Now the the primes are just to say, okay, we're doing that. This is going to be associated with this operation, right? But what we're going to see later, we're going to uh, take get the take the primes away later, and that'll be of use to us. All right, moving on. Okay, so now I want to talk about taking the commutator between psi and pi, and uh, remembering that pi is this, and we're going to find out that this is an interesting, uh, commutating this with this is an interesting thing to do. So, um, we start off, so what I'm really just doing here is I'm foiling this or this whole thing, actually, with this whole thing right here. So I'm going to do this times this, and then this times this, and that's going to be these two guys right here. And you can check that out in detail by pausing this video. All right, and then I can also do... Uh, this times this, and this times this, All right? And let's see here, that would be these two guys right here. Um, let's see here, and then we want to do this times this, and this times this. Because remember, we're doing, here I'll do this in a different color. We're doing psi times pi minus pi times psi. That's the definition of the commutator. So we'll do this times this, and then this 
this, and that's these two guys. And then this times this, and this times this, and that's these two guys. Okay. And then, I want to, so I've color-coded these guys, and these guys are going to, when we bring these guys together, we're going to get this right here. Okay. And then, the same thing, I'm going to take the orange, I color-code the orange guys, and I get... Um, this right here, color code the green guys, like these guys and these are right here, and then the purple ones, these guys right here, are this. Alright, so I've bunched, I've grouped terms together, and then I basically copy this whole line. And we are left with this again, but I'm setting uh, this equal to this. So this omega k equal to this right here. So in places we're going to have the minus, that's just going to be 1, right? Because b to the 0 is just 1. And then in other places we're going to have plus, and that's just going to lead us to 2 omega. Okay, this here is 0, this is 1, we've established this in earlier videos, right? We've established this in earlier videos where this is 1, and same here. Okay, now here. Okay, so we went from this, so we're going to go from this, and now we're really, really going to reduce this, so we're going to get uh, this term and this term, which is this and this. If we can think of a 1 being in front here, and then we're going to put all this back, because remember, we um, left it out, we left these guys out, right, so we have this omega k that came out of these terms, because remember we multiplied this by this, this by this, so every term in here, every term of this is going to have these guys and these guys, right, so we are left with, so the i omega, here's the i omega, and we have the 2v, 2v, and then our omega, our omega's right here. If we zoom in a little bit more, this one was a prime, but I set those equal to each other, right? This is going to cancel out with this, because this is just omega k. Uh, and then everything else, this is not, there's no square root here, because... Um, when we multiply this by this, we're multiplying this by this, right? So we get rid of that square root. And so we can think of this, like that way I didn't put the brackets in, I probably should have. Right, so now we can bring this out. is a definition. I can prove this later on if you want me to, but this is the Kronecker delta. So we're left with this. And we said that we were trying to find the commutation relationship. Erase these. So we we are left now with this relationship. 
now we can go through this entire process again, right, to figure out the rest here. So we figured out this one. We can also do this one. We'll find out that they're both equal to that. And then for the rest here, these are the answers we'll figure out. Right, so this is psi with itself, pi with itself, psi with its adjoint, adjoint with its adjoint, adjoint with adjoint, and pi with its adjoint. And, um, yeah, so this is, these are the results we get from doing similar calculations like this one if we were to consider these as the solutions. I think that is a good wrap up for this video. So we've covered the commutation relations uh, for a complex scalar field. And I'll see you guys in the next one.